Hello, welcome to Fans of Fandom. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wesselman, psychologist, professor, and full-time nerd. On this show, I have deep dive conversations with cool people about things that we're fans of. If you're joining us, chances are you're a fan too. Welcome aboard. This series is called Inside the Cosplay. I'm a fan of cosplay, specifically cosplayers. For some, it's a hobby. Then there are those for whom it's a profession. And for others, it's a way of life. Now, regardless of their motivation, I love watching cosplayers do their thing, their passion, their dedication, their creativity. They're wearing their fandom. So in this series, I'm going to feature some of the cool cosplay folks I've worked with in the con world. Let's get started. Today, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Scott Jordan, cognitive scientist, philosopher, podcast and panel host, and of course, cosplayer. Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for asking me to be here. So why don't we start out? Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your cosplay origin story? Oh, well, that's very, very cool. Thanks for asking. My cosplay origin story is a family story. Um, I'm a big Game of Thrones fan, or at least I was, you know, until the last couple of seasons, but that's a different story. Um, I'm also part of a group called Sister Speak Productions. It's a group of women who do podcasts have been doing them for 15 years about pop culture from a sister's point of view. So I've been writing into them for years. Um, when they were doing the last couple of seasons of game of Thrones, uh, I became known as Sir zombie Scotty of house silver Fox, Lord commander of the sisters guard. So there was this very adult back and forth fun banter going on with them as part of their podcast. And they have these things called family reunions where it's amazing. They just say, we're all going to meet here. And so they met in Nashville in 2017. Um, and at the same, that was the same time that the first ever con of Thrones was happening. So it was an all Game of Thrones con, if you like. So uh, my sister, she had Connie, she had gone to Sister Speak reunion parties with me in the past. So we figured we'd double up. We'd go to the con, we'd do some cosplay and hang out at the con. And then we'd also hang out with the sisters. All right, so that's my sister Connie, and um, this is a little thing I picked up on the left side of the screen there. During the pandemic, people were posting cosplayers, characters, and then the cosplay. So um, we picked a very specific scene out of Game of Thrones. It was season three, the Bear and the Maiden Fair. This is where Bran of Tarth is thrown into a bear pit, and uh, Jamie Lannister, who's missing his right hand, jumps into the pit to save her or help her. <laughs> um, so my sister and I did these cosplays together. She basically made that, she made that dress. She made that sword. You can't see it very well, but she's got like bear claw marks on the left side of her neck. She did that makeup. Uh, she made that burlap rag I'm wearing there. And uh, we made a mess out of the hotel room trying to get that burlap bag dirtier. So there was that cosplay experience of the two of us. And this these three pictures kind of have everything in it that I love about cosplay. One is my sister and I just sitting at a bar talking about what we want to do. And the point I like to make to people is that us sitting around, two of us sitting around talking about what we want to do in a cosplay is just as real life as anybody planning a birthday party. Right. So when I find myself in a creative space like this with people, um, I lose myself pretty quickly and, and just enjoy what we're trying to co-create. Um, then there's another level at which this con in particular was our first, my first cosplay ever. Uh, and uh, at this particular con, uh, most cons, they'll have a cosplay competition. We had never cosplayed before, let alone been in a cosplay competition. So what they do is you come on stage and then if you like, you do a little skit to show the audience who you are, what your characters are. So, you know, we're sitting off stage and people are doing this stuff and, you know, we say to each other, hey, you know, I'm just going to sit there and act like I'm keeping the bear at bay and then you climb over my shoulder, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Well, she did it there and you can see the joy in the, in the judge's eyes off to the side. The crowd roared. It was absolutely amazing. And then the whole Sister Speak reunion party was in the audience and they were screaming for us. It was fantastic. And then it turns out we got 16th place, man, which for us, you know, showing up at the first time was crazy cool. And um, so being in being 
part of something that generates so much joy is uh is is total rush and then down at the bottom here when you go that's the two of us there just taking pictures with random cosplayers that's another part of the cosplay world that i love is just when everybody gets over their anxiety and just starts taking pictures with each other um you have these little moments of of uh, created togetherness and uh I want to point out this guy here. Now, this guy cosplayed Jon Snow. He ended up taking second place in the competition. And I actually met him at a con, and at WonderCon in Anaheim this past March. <laughs> he was still cosplaying Jon Snow. So <laughs> uh, that's my cosplay origin story, right? Um, after that, it was, it was uh, game over. It's something I really enjoy to do. So there's a, um, a, a a lot of themes there that uh, I, I love that you brought up and probably spend, you know, an hour talking about each of them, right? This idea of joy uh, is, I think, is really cool. Um, but I, I noticed, um, at least for me, what I keyed on across your entire story from conception to, to execution um, and also remembrance Right is the extraordinarily social nature uh, of of the activity. Yeah. Um, so uh, talk a little bit about maybe like um. Yeah. No, I'd love to look. Um, in the United States, uh, we've talked before about our hyper individualism. Uh, even in American psychology, um, we run experiments on individuals, and we discover individual differences. And when it comes to how we connect with each other, the dominant theory is theory of mind, Premick and Woodruff, who argues that we actually can't read each other's minds. We can't feel each other's emotions because all we really have direct access to with anyone is their observable behavior. And over the last 20, 30 years, data have just shown how profoundly wrong this idea is um, because data have made it clear I'm not even going to talk about pheromones, all right? I'm not even going to talk about how we're constraining each other's behavior simply by the chemicals we... I'm not even going to go there. What I'll talk about is uh, people like to call them mirror neurons, and that's fine. They became special because we thought it was so bizarre for people to be able to connect to each other. Um, but in my work, what I argue the data, the issue of life, the challenge of a human being is not learning how to connect with people for most of us we're born resonators in other words uh for most people uh when i see someone do something like pick up a coffee cup what it means for me to see that person is for me to be put in the same planning states of picking up my own cup of coffee so we've been treating We've been treating what it means to see people, what it means to experience people as if we're taking a movie of them. And and then we have to process it cognitively to figure out their motives. And when the data indicate that, no, what's actually going on is for me to see you means for you to put me in your planning states, then uh, we're kind of connected by default. And then the developmental issue becomes inhibition. I mean, a lot of people don't like this because they think, you know, we're supposed to let everybody in. But as you've heard me say before, that's just a lie. Every, we all, everybody has someone that they keep at a distance. So um, being social, I mean, for me, philosophically, it's even much broader than that. But in the framework of experimental psychology, um, uh, there is no... I would argue that the self is is a uh, is a collection of embodied others, and when I'm with you, and we're resonating to each other, that means I'm allowing you into my resonance systems. That means that you become part of how my brain works, even when you're not around. When I go to someone else, or if I leave someone else out, I'm denying that person access to become part of who I am. So this idea, the American idea that I'm a self, I've got to know who I am, and then it's hard for me to figure everyone else out, is actually pretty bass backwards. And um, it, I, I would argue, is potentially dangerous. We can talk about that more. So this 
cosplay thing is a celebration of our um is a celebration of resonance uh, at all these different scales and then just jumping into it taking the risk of it not working because i've had that happen before as well um and uh, celebrating celebrating what we are i guess mm -hmm. yeah it's the uh these ideas of of self right uh who we are uh which is a tricky concept uh, i love how when you when you started also your story when you were talking about your sort of uh jam session if you will with your sister right mm -hmm. you use the term losing yourself yep right um who we are we are a collection of individual characteristics but we're also a collection of our relationships yeah um you know personally uh when we talk about cosplaying as well you know a lot of people will talk about choosing characters that they connect with in some way right so you mentioned this this person who uh you saw them multiple times playing Jon Snow yeah. right um there's something about the character of Jon Snow that presumably that individual has brought into their self-concept in some way yeah he or looks maybe, just like Jon Snow <laughs> he looks just like Jon Snow I mean I you know and I mean the the, the the extent to which he looks like the guy who played Jon Snow it's just crazy yeah absolutely so let's uh, you know um let's sort of uh, pivot into what is um you know you've tried multiple cosplays at this point in time yeah as you noted some went well some didn't work you took the risk Mm. Uh, and risk means that you're not always going to win right. um but uh what what would you say are a couple of your favorite cosplays oh man so <laughs> they all end up being extremely special for extremely different reasons hmm. so i'll share my screen real quick the one that probably is the least popular is joe miller from the expanse um so joe miller is uh, i'm not going to explain the entire experience what i'll say he's a man who lives in a space he was born in but doesn't want to be part of the culture that he's in and so he idolizes earth culture even though he lives on an asteroid and he dresses like an american detective right and and he just has this beautiful arc throughout the story um you can see there um that lower picture there there's a woman he sort of falls in love with i've had a chance to talk with the writers about how they should have done that scene differently but nonetheless he uh falls in love with this woman who sacrifices her wealth and her privilege for the for the benefit of what are called the belters and the underprivileged and there's this gorgeous scene where he and she are sort of in the same space surrounded by this thing called the proto molecule so those are those blue lights that you see on the on the um on the black belt mat in front of me and very few people know who I'm doing uh when I do Joe Miller yet for me there's I just love this character so much I will admit he's probably closer to my age than any other character in the story <laughs> uh and then this idea that at in that older age he still found something he loved and it brought him grace i just think that's a, a stunning tale and uh those two guys up there they're from they're actors from the expanse um this was c2e2 not last year but the year before 22 i think and you can see if you look closely there's a plastic divider between us there uh because we we're still worried about covid and what was so friggin' amazing about this experience is you, I, my Joe Miller costume there, it's not the best, right? But they looked at me, they, they, you know how you do, they shuck you in a booth with five other people and you got to get in front of the camera and they just move you through quickly. So uh, they get, we get in this room, five people, and I swear to God, I was like third or fourth in line. These two guys, they look at me and they go, Miller! And so there's this instant resonance. And uh, then I, it was my turn. I had 10 seconds. I said, okay, you, I want you to look like you're screaming. I should get out of your head. That's from the story. And then uh -huh. you, I want you to look at the camera and point at the two of us. Like what the hell are these idiots doing? And they did it. They did it with no argument. They had an absolute blast. It was smiles on around when we left. And so what I loved about that moment was they appreciated the work, right? They appreciated my commitment to the character. And then 
and then asking them to celebrate it with me and be part of it. They, I just, for Christ's sake, how many people had they been with that day? Yet they right. still found a way to just not take a pat photo. But and by the way, this is how I love to do my cosplay photos is to act it out, you know. Uh -huh. So that next that next image on there, that's my sister and I. Uh, she uh, cosplayed Christian Albasara, who's the baddest ass woman ever on television. And I'm doing my Joel Miller there. And we took that picture in the hallway and then I just overlaid it over the deck of the Rasinante. Um all of these things are things that I love about cosplay. And nobody one there, I'll, I'll, I'll say I'll tell you this story and I'll shut up. Uh when I did this, my first Joel Miller cosplay, it's the one you saw with uh, with me sitting at the desk with the lights, and this young man, well, you thought it was a young man, came by and he takes a picture. Then the next thing you know, it shows up on Facebook and he says, oh, look, Joel Miller and Julie Miles too. Julie Miles, the woman in the picture. Uh -huh. So I contacted him. We got to talking. And the next thing you know, we're doing uh, a couple of expanse panels together at LA Con last November. And they were just delightful panels. I got to be in there with the writers of the show. I got to be in there with set designers of the show. And um, usually I'm with a bunch of psychologists and I love them. And it's fun to be the only psychologist every once in a while, right? So then after that, we went up, went up one of the guy's room. We had a couple of drinks from the type of scotch they were drinking in the show. Um, those are just, for me, very awesome, groovy human moments. Nobody knows who I'm playing but those guys, right? So that ended up being one of the most unknown people I've played, least recognizable ended up being this thing that had this huge relational payout. Um, I'm still, I'm still a friends. Um, Michael P is his name. He's the Uber fan of the expanse for the, for the country. He's been to this, they've invited him to the set and everything. So again, the, another part of this is do your thing. You know, try to tell students, get out into the world, sell your wares, do the job, be positive, And you never know who's in the audience. Right. And um most of the things that I really like about how my career has turned out have come around by me saying my perspective, selling my wares in the public square at a conference, at a talk, and just having people in the audience who didn't know me hear it and want to hear more. So that's a great experience. Yet in terms of cosplay, it's probably the one that fails the most in terms of the fewest number of people recognizing it. Well, and, and and so that that's that's an interesting um, uh, point you end on there because you know, and you use scare quotes. And I think I I know perhaps why, or at least uh, I interpret it as you know, what is success yep. in terms of cosplay? Right, we could define it as the number of people who want to take your picture or the number of people who give you positive feedback. Yep. But you know, one can say if that's what you want then pick characters that are recognizable, right? Yeah. Chose one mattered to you, but that presumably you knew going in was going to be a bit esoteric. Right? Yeah. Um, and and I, I love how, um, you know, when you talked about being recognized, albeit at, at the beginning from people from the show, you said there was an immediate resonance. Oh, yeah. But, you know, you also had this other moment with uh, an Uber fan. Yeah. Who also got you right oh yeah i, I was um uh at this last c2e2 uh that we went to um we were walking to uh the bus and i walked mm. by uh a dad and his kid and the kid was probably a teenager i'm not sure where within that but you know mm -hmm. uh we'll say late junior high perhaps early high school uh and he was dressed up as um uh, the character of Virgil from the Devil May Cry series, which mm. I played when I was younger. I've been playing mm. the new ones recently. My older son's getting into it, so it's fresh in my mind. And mm. it, But I did a double take, and I was like, Virgil! And the mm. kid just popped this huge grin, right? Yes. Um, because he's not even playing the main character in that story, right? <laughs> right? Um, so um, I, uh, I just, I really love that moment because not only did I feel like we had resonance, but yeah doing theory of minds he was probably thinking i didn't expect anybody to to know no and that that's taking their 
taking that risk right so mm -hmm. it leads to those moments of wow somebody got it right yes. um and and th those are very big moments like you know suddenly i saw the guy taking a picture of me um put it on facebook and then I, oh okay he knew who i was he knew exactly what i was going for with my black felt and my christmas lights and a picture uh -huh. and uh and uh that was that was really cool um i also like to play dr brenner from stranger things mm -hmm. um and i had to what i like to do though is i like to play doctor i like to play characters like either from a specific scene uh mm -hmm. or um as if something else had happened so i continue the story with my character so um at the end of season one dr brunner gets attacked by a demogorgon and then we don't see him and everybody thinks he's dead so i got in the habit of playing dr brunner as if um as if um he had lived, but not only had he lived, he killed that Demogorgon, right? So uh -huh. what I got in the habit of doing was dressing up as Dr. Brenner and then walking around with a, I bought a, a Demogorgon life-size head, kind of head size life-size -y head mask. And you can't see it all that well in these pictures, but I then... I, I take the mouth, it's like I have five jaws, and I buy fake blood, and I get a bunch of cotton swabs, and I do blood all over his teeth, and then uh -huh. I put it up to my face, and I take a big bite, and I just let the blood fall where it falls, and it gets all over my shirt, right? Uh -huh. And so I show up as Dr. Brenner as if he survived that fight and killed the Demogorgon and cut off his head. Um, I was also, when I was making the costume, I was struggling with... Um, how to carry the head right and i thought man i'll just get some butch rope you know and i and then i said no brenner doesn't have time to go shop at the store for for uh for rope he's going to use his tie and his belt so you can see that what i've done is i've tied my tie and my belt together and then i tie them onto the other jaws of the demogorgon and i walk around with them um i'll come back to this in a second um but i remember walking around not too many people really got it but i was walking through the hall and this young lady runs up and said oh my god that is so cool right and so you, you know i've got, the person i cosplay that's most easily recognizable is logan mm -hmm. and very rarely does anybody run up to me and say oh my god you're logan it's so cool because it's just logan right it's a cool <laughs> logan but it's just logan but when they see, oh, that guy, oh, he killed it. Oh, oh, that, you know, then you see the clicking going on. Then you know that it's just super duper special. Everybody understood the small scale script you wrote, or at least somebody does. And um, those are just very special, uh, very special kind of moments. It's like your friend, your little kid you mentioned who didn't know if anybody would recognize him. Um, that, and that's an interesting... Um tension right like um because you've got you know logan right is the cool logan but there's a lot of logans yeah right? and you know even if you're doing a unique riff that isn't done with the other logans you know right. um doing a character who is a little bit more niche or a little less common you know even if recognizable right, right. you stand out more and yeah. It's like, you know, a lot of psychological theorists who look at identity and belonging, they debate on whether to what degree they, um, this idea of like, uh, what aspects of our identity are driven by wanting to belong, wanting to connect with everyone else and sort of be part of a similar crowd, and what aspects are to stand out, right? Mm -hmm. So you're in a con space, you're in a nerd fan space. Y'all know you're there for generally similar things. You found your people, but you also, not you, I'll, I'll say you. I get you. No, I get you. Want to also be recognized for individual aspects as well. You know, what, what do we think mm -hmm. sets us out compared to others? What do we bring to the table? Um, and um, yeah, you know, that that's very interesting. And as I'm familiar with the theory you talk about, and I'm not sure about the dependent measures they assess to 
uh, measure those things. Um, what on the one hand, I, I, I yeah, sure, I want to be the center of attention. I'm not going to argue that. And I want to be creative. I just want to take it somewhere that it may not have been taken before. And it, it, and the one that I can't, on the one hand, I can't deny that that's a social thing because I am paying attention to what the rest of the world's done in order to, you know, quote unquote, stand out. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, it, it's standing out in the sense that a young lady runs up to you and said, Oh my God, you know, that is so cool. Other and 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 from another perspective, it's being creative and then having someone recognize how creative you've been. Now that could be called standing out, and and, and maybe it is. Um uh, yeah, in the Brenner case, yeah. And then in the long term, once you go to a few constructs, that way people start to recognize you. And uh, and that's pretty cool as well. Yeah. For me, so, it, it, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Use the term creative, right? And then mm -hmm. we could once again, well, psychologists and other sorts of uh, social scientists have spent decades trying to figure out how to define creativity, right? But if we think of this in the context of the self, some self theorists talk about like the different levels of scale, right? The individual aspects of ourself, these relational aspects, and then the more collective. And at least among American and, and Western focused psychologists, there's a tendency to describe the individualistic aspects mm. in isolation. But and maybe this is because I'm a social psychologist, but I think, well, all three levels are social. You no. know, the, the shift might be different. In the case of individual characteristics, that's still social because it's what no. makes me an individual, what makes me a creative, what makes me different and stand out mm -hmm. still involves a comparison, right? So I'm tall. Well, what does that mean? That that there that means that there's a comparison uh, to what is tall defined by what is short, right? So there's still this, this tension or maybe border, if you will, mm -hmm. which I know you think a lot about. Um, so... Uh, well, the things you're the things you're getting to, um, the idea of living in multiple scales simultaneously is, you know, is all about is all about what wild systems theory is about. You and I know each other. You know that I've been working on wild systems theory for a while, um, and one thing I've come to through this work is there's nothing that exists that is what it is without a border between itself and the context that it embodies. And um, for me, this goes all the way down to, to the electron, the single cell organism, the multi-cell organism, molecules, whatever scale you want to talk about. Um, the work, the energy capture that goes on and sustaining the ability that those, the stability that those things be, the stability that those things are, all of that is emerging, and I, I would just call it a reality of flux. Um, for me, that we either we, we we experience reality one of two ways: either we look at reality as made up of stable things, we don't ask ourselves a lot about how they're stable, and then we do the calculus of how they change, right? And that's where the Western world started with you know balls falling down an incline, acceleration velocity, you know. Um, there's another way to look at things, and that's um looking at the world as um un instability or flux or whatever however you want to call it and then asking yourself how can stability ever come to be and that's the way i look at the re at the world so how does that incline how does that ball on the incline ever become a ball how does it stay being a ball and uh, it has to not to get too ontological or philosophical in me it's how it's how it Cap, how how it captures energy and how it uses that energy to keep itself a system. And so um, this is the idea that I call being, B-E-I-N-G. And uh, we be a multiple things and we expend a lot of energy keeping those things stable. And uh, so... Yeah, I live in multiple space. I live in multiple forms of being at the same time. And um, 
you know, some people, well, I'll stop there. What, uh, what do you feel from your perspective uh, is one of the biggest strengths uh, of the cosplay community? So I'm going to talk about all this from a very personal uh, perspective. Um, I know that when I go out and cosplay, I'm taking a risk, even though there are other people out there that are cosplaying. Um, I'm taking, I'm taking risk at um, not in, ending up not interacting with anyone or, you know, and uh, so when I did this stranger, I mean, stranger, uh, stranger things is, is, is an example this is my sister and I again deciding to do a, 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 a team cosplay about Stranger Things. She plays an FBI agent who's part of C uh, season one. And again, we, I like to act out the scenes. And of course, that's our friend, Dr. Leandra Paris playing Elle. And, um, you know, you look at the people in the back of the picture, and like, what the hell are these people doing? Um, we're, I would argue that what we're doing here is celebrating celebrating our borders uh quite often cosplay cosplay gets treated as um something different from daily life and the shirt i'm wearing now the glasses i'm wearing the hairstyle i'm wearing this is cosplay this is me projecting a certain border in a certain space at a certain time uh i showed up with a shirt on i could have showed up without one on i could have worn shown up with a suit why am i wearing this because it's a podcast i want to look old and stiff right i want to, I want to so in other words i'm cosplaying uh the person that i think got this the most is actually not psychologist but uh a sociologist by the name of irving goffman uh wrote a fantastic book the presentation of self in everyday life and what i learned from reading goffman my second year in college when I was assigned the entire book and had to read the entire first author text uh, for a sophomore level high school college, excuse, sophomore level college course was life is performative. I mean, now that's contemporary language. Uh -huh. My language is life is being and all being necessitates borders that are sustained through work. Mm -hmm. So me putting the shirt on me, putting the hair on me, wearing the glasses, this is all the work. I'm doing to sustain the border of Sir Zombie Scotty. And cosplay is a celebration of that. When we go to work, when we show up dressed a certain way, we're taking a risk. We're putting ourselves in a group of people. And, you know, most people, a lot of people avoid the risk by basically just wearing what everyone else is wearing. Now, mm -hmm. that's not an insult. Maybe that's not a level of risk you want to deal with today. You just want to get to work and do what you got to do. So, you know, um, and huge individual differences and, you know, extroversion, uh, nar uh, yeah, narcissism, straight up, right? Or neuroticism. So all these different things are playing around with the borders I sustain, the work I do. So for me, cosplay is a celebration of that work. And it's, I'm not going to use the word religious or spiritual. I don't want to, you know, at the same time, the profound amount of joy, the profound amount of, of things that happen in a space when I'm willing to take that risk and, and, uh, and walk into a space and present myself as Brenner as if he killed the Demogorgon. Um, that space is also providing an, a space for others to celebrate borders and to celebrate uh, the fact that we're performing every day of our lives. So one of the things about Stranger Things, and there's a story, there is a story here. So you can see Vanessa here, uh, right here. And then there's another lady over here who's dressed the same as Vanessa. They're both playing the character L in a particular episode where she was at a mall. And, and um, so when in this pro in the schedule, it said that there was going to be um, a Stranger Things cosplay meetup. So when we went to the meetup row, 
There was no one there with a camera. There was no one there telling anyone what to do. There was just a bunch of backgrounds, right? And you and you, know, you had to occupy the background. So um, I was sitting there, standing there with Vanessa and this other young lady dressed like Elle. And I said, okay, if you guys stay here and look for people that are cosplayed as Stranger Things and just tell them to wait, I'll walk down the row here. And if I see Stranger Things people, I'll tell them we're all going to meet down here and, you know. So I walk away and the young lady, she asked Vanessa, is, is he in charge? You know, and I wasn't at the same time. I'm, a, I'm an older guy. You know, I'm an older adult. And I knew nothing was going to happen unless we made it happen. So you can see that the average age of the people in this picture here is probably 20.5. Right. And but I'm walking down this row looking like I look in that picture Talking to these young people, say, hey, if you guys want to do a Stranger Things fun, go down there. We're all meeting down there. And they did. Nobody looked at me like it was an old creep. No one looked at me like, what are you doing here, man? Leave me alone. You're not my dad. Uh, uh, everybody was into it. And, and so then there was a group of Marvel dudes, and they were kind of huddled around a thing. And I said, hey, Thor, do you mind if we use the backdrop for a while? And uh, Thor said yes, and they moved out, and we just took all of these wonderful pictures, and it was just this huge celebration of borders. And um, often the word borders is used uh, as if it's a negative thing, and and I think that's too bad. Um, we have to have borders to be someone. So celebrate our different someones, pretend to be a different someone, and then do it with a bunch of other people doing the same thing. I mean, you know, people have been having masquerade parties forever. So, uh, well, and I ahead. think uh, celebrating different someone's that uh, that phrase you use, just how I resonate with that now, is almost like there, there's recognition of borders, but there's almost border border testing the recognition that borders can be shiftable right uh or um permeable uh yeah. situation spe uh, specific um you talk about life as per, uh life as as performing very so from a gaming mm -hmm. sort of a, a gaming perspective right there are certainly folks who study identity development who will talk about how partic at particularly formative stages adolescence being a big mm -hmm. one for uh, emerging adult there is a lot of trying on of, of different yeah. um aspects uh and fandom spaces um you know if we take it even further to what we might call subcultures right you know mm. well, this is discussed a lot in terms of like music and things like that but these are are ways of figuring out what our borders are who we are and do they have to be rigid right so a lot of the early fandom work um uh talked a lot about being a weekend fan or, or only on my weekends right like during mm -hmm. the week you know, and this is this is something that hasn't has changed somewhat, uh, but not always. It depends on the fandom. But a lot of those Earth fans who were fans of like of Star Trek, of Beauty and the Beast, of sci-fi fantasy, and <laughs> shows that are very niche, um, may especially if they're grown up, they're adults. They feel like they can't bring that with them into all aspects of their life, right? Mm -hmm. So they're like, okay, during my day job, I keep this closeted if you will and then on the weekends i go to cons or now that we have e-based mm -hmm. ways of of communicating i go online after work and i find those folks and i can let that aspect of my identity out a little bit mm -hmm. um, th these tensions of recognizing contextual nature of of identity I kind of rambled a lot there, but <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, the thing is, this is play. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, I, it's a very Bowie-esque aspect of who I am at this point in my life. I mean, you know, David Bowie reinvented himself multiple times and every time he did, he took a risk. Now, what risk did he take? Well, that he wouldn't be a popular rock star. Right. Um, and over time, taking those risks became part of his identity and um one of the things that the border play does is um it is it's 
I rarely ever see any despair in 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 what's going on when I'm with people in a cosplay situation. Um, and at the same time, because we are all embodiments of context, um, things could always be different. And recognizing that our own identity is an emergent byproduct of our own lived life mm -hmm. uh, um, is something that I think if we were to teach this more to younger people, um, there there are ro I don't want to I don't want to use words like happiness or mental health. That's not who I am. I'm going to use the word self respect. Right there, there are ways to garner self respect out of recognizing the transience of being, and recognizing the thoroughly. That's why I call us embodiments of context, because for me, the ultimate reality is context, and and we can talk about uh, that if you like. Um, but celebrating the fact, celebrating the work, celebrating being by playing with borders. Um, and then as an older guy, walking up to these young people and say, yo, let's go play with borders over here together, right? And I may sound creepy, and I'm sorry to anybody out there who thinks it was creepy for me to say that, but look, I mean, I'm, we're playing. <laughs> I mean, you know, and this picture here, man, this kid came up to me, this young man came up to me and said, can I take, can we take a picture? And I said, yeah, but only if you try to flay my mind. And, uh, and uh, so he tried to flay my mind. That's just a brilliant picture right there, man. And then I, every one of these young people that came up to me and well, I, I would ask them to, it was give and take, right? But every one of them, I said, no, we're not just going to sit here and look at the camera. We're going to act it out. So these two ladies, they would be characters that are furious with me for one reason or another in the show. So they acted out. Um, this is the closest to looking at the camera. And of course, this is a kind of looking at the camera. Um, but hidden, hidden behind all that joy, I'm not going to say hidden. That's not the way. It's just there's um, um helping younger people helping anybody a private providing a context for anybody to play with their borders is for me practice in the kung fu of being so um i like to, I, for some reason no one calls me an old creep we hang out we act out take pictures and um and the same time i think we all uh come to feel and enjoy and live within our borders uh a bit more, I don't know, coherently with a bit more self-respect, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, so um, adulting. I, I love the, uh, the sort of emergent term that uh, has just come out of our conversation here, border play, right? Uh, I, I feel like uh, <laughs> we need to, to stamp that uh, uh, somehow. Uh, yeah, the, it's in the stuff I write. Huh? <laughs> it's in yeah. the stuff I write. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, that'll, that'll be a chapter in the next book, right? Co uh, cosplay equals border play. <laughs> yeah, or being is border play. I mean, you uh, mentioned that you mentioned the weekend, the weekend cosplayer. Um, that's border play, uh, right? Why are they not? Why am I not wearing my cosplay in the middle of the street tomorrow? All yeah. right, because because in that context, I'm. I'm presenting borders and uh, the resonance is minimally possible. Um, well, and, and you, you could, right? Yeah. yeah, but you're choosing not to, right? I mean, so um, that's a recognition. I mean, there, um, it, for example, there's a, a documentary uh, called uh, uh, Trekkies. Uh, it's a two-parter actually. And yeah. one of the things that I show that to students and also one of the things that really got a lot of media attention was a real life case uh, in the 90s, um, uh, a person who was a huge Star Trek fan, a person chose to wear a Star Trek uniform to work regularly, um, mm. that was part of that person's identity. And I think um, what, what got the national attention and the attention of the filmmakers was that person was in jury duty and they chose oh, yeah, I've seen to wear a Star Trek yeah. uniform there, right? Yeah. They took a risk, yeah. that risk, had in terms of recognition, but also negatives in terms of blowback, right? Yeah. 
Um, well, you know, that, that's, that, that's another thing is um, I'm, I'm never going to tell anybody you should do this. Um, what I want to, what I will say is if you want to exercise your identity, this is a way to, to exercise, right? Mm -hmm. Um, for example, kids that are right now, there's a whole generation of young people uh, exercising the notion of gender fluidity, um, mm -hmm. and exercising how they carry themselves in terms of their bodies and their clothing, how they carry themselves and how they relate to other people. And then carrying themselves in terms of their parents and, and institutions and um, people won't like my use of the word play because we confuse play with, uh, you know, the thing that kids do. Um, uh, being is play. You, you, you take risks or you don't, but you're still playing. You're still dressing in those clothes, going to work every day, um, going shopping. So, um, so, my yeah, attitude no, no, is. I, I, go I, ahead. I, oh, sorry. You met. You mentioned gender. Um, <clears throat> I remember reading uh, back in grad school an article uh, by two uh, sociologists, Wes and Zimmerman. I don't remember their first names, um, but uh, it was you know a paper that was very prominent in a seminar I was taking and ended up influencing my thesis. Mm. They um, the the title they talked about was doing gender. So they just described gender as basically as performative as something that someone does every day and, and you talked about this in different ways when you reference Goffman another sociologist right, right? <laughs> so there's a through line there um I've seen people talk for example about uh, the concept of of drag performance right mm -hmm. as another riff on this idea of how we are performing or playing or expressing identity and and how that can be contextual yeah, not celebrating borders, right? And um, the thrill of, you know, um, pushing borders. Um, and there's, 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 there's a, there's affect there. Um, mm -hmm. And it's exciting. And it's uh, risky. So yeah, no, it's all part of the gig. Um, I'm going to switch uh, tracks a little bit. Yeah. Um, you uh, you mentioned a few times uh, this idea of you being older, at least mm. older comparatively to yeah. um, uh, the folks you were interacting with in those cosplay spaces, right? And you you have come to cosplay a little later in life compared to when at least a lot of modern cosplayers come yeah, into it. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, and I, and I know you've uh, I've, I've been with you to panels about like cosplaying middle age in middle age or cosplayers ah, over right. thirty or whatever. And talk to me a little bit about about the conversations there. And um, you know, sort of uh, I guess if you were running a panel, you know, mm. on cosplayers who are middle right. age, whatever that is, <laughs> um, you can call me old man. It's all good. So older, right? I'm no, old too. I, I, you see, the thing is, man, you know, we're all everybody's everybody's living borders. Uh, that's not an insult. That's not judgy. That's the way I've been able to sort of understand the world, the, my live life, my scientific life, my philosophical life, my parental life. What comes across in all of it in the end is border maintenance. And um and so people, when people use the language that we use always reveals the borders we're maintaining. Mm -hmm. So when people say that I'm old, that I can take that as something about me. And I wouldn't deny that, you know, I'm sitting here with a practically gray beard. I get what they're after. While at the same time, it reveals everything about the the bubbles they use to to keep their identity moving and i try more and more and more and i i think i'm actually pretty good at it is letting people express their cognitive borders i call it their cognitive skin right the the words that people use what what psychologists do is create lexicons of words people use but when you talk to communication scholars and you talk about talk to rhetoricians the collection of words people tend to use are more like an organism 
than a lexicon or a dictionary because those words all mean something in relation to each other. So listen to someone of my age talk versus listen to someone 20 years old talk, and there's going to be a different way that words work with each other. And it's because all their words are gaining meaning in relation to all of the other words in their vocabulary. And that reveals what they expect of the world, what they expect of themselves, and what they expect of others. All of that comes out in the words that they use. So um, I've gotten pretty good at experiencing people's words as tell me more, <laughs> you know, let, let me see who you are. Let me see where your cognitive skin is. And, um, and so that said, still doesn't mean I don't get pissed off if someone calls me old and they're being mean about it. Right. But, um, but for me, that was cog that cognitive skin is the same thing I'm doing to my body when I'm cosplaying. I'm I'm presenting uh, uh, I'm presenting something to context that's embodiment of context and pushing context a little bit, and it's revealing how I'm in context, what I expect, you know. Um, and so, if I were to talk to an if I were to do, uh, for example, I, I don't know if I were to do a panel for an over thirty cosplay kind of quite often when i go to these things the conversation is you're not old you can still do it and um i would say you're doing this every day of your life so come here and celebrate that right now right. if you want to wear the stuff you wear to work you know and say this is who i am every day that's a cool cosplay right i mean there's uh so i would say well i i I would say you're invited to come here and play with borders and um, the age, uh, the 12 year old, the 20 year old, they're nervous too. So be generative when you're, when you're, when you're walking down the aisles, tell people when you recognize their outfit, tell them it looks great. Um, now you don't have to do that, but what I'm saying is, when you do those kind of things, just like in daily life, when you walk around and you say, hey, you did a good job on that, man, or hey, that looks cool, or I really like what you did there. Well, what we don't understand is all of those things are transforming the world, the context that those people are doing their being within. So uh, we can make the world a place that's more inclusive and positive just by being more inclusive and positive. <laughs> it's not that hard, yeah. right? Um, so. Yeah, if I were to talk to them, I'd say, oh, and as an older person, you have the opportunity to be perhaps more, you have more of an opportunity to be a leader than if you're 20, right? In other words, you you are older, you have an opportunity. And then one of the things I dig, like, I don't think about it when I'm taking that Stranger Things picture with all those young people, but they're going to remember taking a picture with a 60-year-old guy to us, you know, like, damn. Yeah. And you're showing them what 60 and yeah, man, you know, I mean, in other words, then they've got a different, their words, their thoughts become somewhat different. And if yeah, we can come to go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I, uh, um, I, I, I love the point you, I, I'm, I love all the points you make there, but well, this idea of, you don't have to love them all, man. It's all good. Not that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but this idea of modeling, Right. I mean, so we, we think of these terms that we use old and sometimes we use them negatively, but there's also there is life experience. There's respect. There's authority, perceived authority that that is baked in the cake. Right. You know, and you're showing them a different way to be. Right. So like when I I will jokingly say and only half joking to my students, you know, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, mm -hmm. you know, and that's kind of true. Um because when we talk about play, when a lot of people who felt closeted about their fandoms, certainly back in the right. early days of fan studies, but even now, they'll use terms like people tell me I need to to grow up or whatever. Mm -hmm. And by modeling as a 60-year-old player, yeah. you're like, hey, these things that you love, you can still love them. It's okay, right? Yeah. It's, it's, well, you know, it, and again, it doesn't mean that it's always going to work out for them. It doesn't, sure. you know, that's, you know, that's the thing is it is risk and recognizing yes. that, you know, you're taking a risk. Um, 
I don't know if it if it buffers anybody a little more from the negativity. I've I've never really seen anybody get dissed in cosplay. Um, yet I'm sure that it happens. You know, our uh, La Vie cosplay. I'm sure they have stories about people who have been dissed because this looks like that. This looks like that. Um, um, the the thing I if I if I were to coach right and i'm a cosplay coach it would not be much different from being a life coach and and that is everybody's taking a risk here now some people have more opportunity than you had some people this that might be a lot more privilege um at the same time you get there by taking risk you get there by taking the jump the things that i've respected the most in my life are things where i just stopped thinking and eventually jumped you know, and and it changed, you know, going to Germany for a year on my postdoc changed my life. Taking my daughter to Germany for six months when she was seven years old changed my life. Um, so I think it's terribly important to, as much as possible, experience yourself as an agent making choices and then suffering the, and celebrating the consequences of those choices um, as you've heard me say before, the slings of arrows of outrageous fortune are coming, period. So you're more likely to get through it if you've got somewhere you're headed. And uh, that comes from agency. And we know there are huge individual differences in agency. And I will admit I have an abundance of agency. So, uh, you know, I don't want to sit here and say everybody needs agency. What I will say is that um, don't underestimate the power of your choices. And um, you take the risk. If you take the risk to throw yourself in the mix, it might go poorly, but it definitely will never go the way it will go better if you don't do it. And of course, that's an old saying. So, so um, yeah, I, I I tend not to tell people what they should do. Right? I if I were to tell everybody what to do, I would say find a way to live with self respect. That's not based on debasing others. If I were to say, what should you do? Because once you tell people to try to live a life of self-respect and and by not debasing others, they usually end up, if it happens, living a life of self-respect based on um, uh, making things better for others, becoming more other-regarding. So, so yeah, if yeah. you're going to be an old person out there doing cosplay, uh, take the risk to be nicer to people. And encourage the young folk. I feel like that's a t-shirt. Take the risk to be nicer to people. Yeah, right? absolutely. <laughs> <Or a bumper laughs> sticker. Absolutely, man. No, absolutely. And it is risky. You yeah. never know what they're gonna say. Let's um pivot uh pivot to we've talked a lot about cosplay, right? Yeah. Um what are some things that you're a fan of that people might not expect? <laughs> oh, well, I'll, I will share a cosplay story related to that. Mm -hmm. So my favorite superhero is Jessica Jones. And uh, the reason Jessica Jones is my superhero, my favorite superhero is because she can deconstructs um the superhero um, motif by not wanting to be one and struggling to be who she is. And anyway, so my favorite villain is therefore Kilgrave, the purple man. And he, he's of course, Jessica Jones, the nemesis. Uh, he's He showed up in daredevil in the sixties. He's a guy who secretes pheromones that allow him to take over people's minds and basically, he suggests something to them, and they feel like they came up with the idea themselves, and they feel a compulsion to do what he says. So, um, do I love the Purple Man? Hell no. But what I love is the way that Brian Bendis wrote the Purple Man and Jessica Jones in the early 2000s. I won't go into the page, but there's a whole page where Jessica Jones explains what it was like to be under the Purple Man's control. And all of us have been in situations where we're doing something, but we're not sure it's what we wanted to do. And then we're asking ourselves, why the hell am I doing this? And we recognize we're doing it because someone or something else wanted us to do it. And that 
cognitive dissonance is somewhere that I live in the world of, of the agency research. I've been talking to agency a lot. The choices we make shape what we see. They shape what we believe. We underestimate the value of choice because we all think it's about something that happens in the moment and dictates what I'm going to do right now with my finger, right? But I always ask my students, how many of you remember the day you decided to come to Illinois State? And they all raise their hand. I say, yeah, it was about six months ago, wasn't it? Yeah. And I said, now look how per look at where you are right now. The people in the room, the room you're in, the stuff you read, none of that would be happening in your life right now if you hadn't made that choice. So don't never underestimate the value that your choices make. So I, I think we actually do a disservice in our field. A lot of people running around saying we don't have conscious will, blah, 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 blah. So all that is why I love the Jessica Jones Purple Man narrative. I love the arguments. And uh, so I, I organized a panel at WonderCon in March. Um, no, you stop. Marvelous women in comics and on the screen. And so there's a panel of my female, my women, female women colleagues who all cosplayed as Shiro. Um, and I played, I cosplayed Kilgrave the Purple Man. Now I did this like full on, brother. I mean, I practiced getting my face purple. So this was my first try, and it wasn't that bad. This was my second try, and I got it better. But the day that I showed that picture to my sister, who's always my sort of wartime conciliary, and she said, dude, what's with the pink hair? He's got brown hair. So I didn't do the pink hair. So this is what it looked like on stage that day. And what was so groovy, man, was the people that run the panels, they usually put your name on a placard, right? Kilgrave the Purple Man. Was that not the coolest? Anyway, so these these are the sheroes on the panel. And um, I was asking them questions like, what makes female female heroes unique? Do they bring something different to heroism? So we did that panel. And then um, during the Q&A, um, and this is the question, what's something that you like that people may not know about? Well, I like, I don't like the Purple Man, but I like the Jessica Jones Purple Man, contra you know, contradictions. And But there was someone in the audience who was very concerned that I was cosplaying the Purple Man during a She Rose panel and actually said, you know, in the middle of the panel, Dr. Jordan, no diss on you, but I was really excited about coming to this panel. And then I show up and it's being moderated by Kilgrave, the Purple Man, who's the, the worst sexual abuser in Marvel. Was that a joke? It's like, damn, she just, you know, went straight at it, right? And what I've learned to do, as I said earlier, is just take in the words, right? And because it's so easy to, to become defensive. And I was comfortable in what I was doing. I wasn't doing what I was doing by myself. I was doing it with this panel of wonderful colleagues. And uh, the first thing that happens, I think Shelly Clevenger says, no, 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 no. We're going to beat him up afterwards, right? <laughs> now, on. Uh, that's the whole bailiwick right there, right? This wasn't me doing the Purple Man. I was doing the Purple Man, right? But it was us sort of collectively embodying this contradiction of the patriarchy. And of course, I was there as probably one of the worst representatives of the patriarchy, not to be a jerk, but to sort of keep in mind, uh, embodied and on stage, uh, what people want to smash when they talk about smash the patriarchy. Um, and so I, I got an assist from my colleagues. And then again, like I said, I didn't go defensive. But what I did say is, you know, is, um, yes, this is all intentional. I, I wore this. I did this, all this work on purpose. And now that you've asked, now I can talk about it, right? Uh -huh. And what people don't understand about Kilgrave, and Bendis never really wrote this, in, in the last four in the last Jessica Jones uh, uh, run, he in, he intimated this idea, but didn't say it explicitly, but maybe because he didn't totally, completely get it. But um, because Kilgrave doesn't ever have to ask anybody for anything, he can just tell them what he wants. He's never been able to fall in love. 
because when we fall in love, what we do is we reveal our weaknesses to someone and they reveal their weaknesses to us. And then we, over time, slowly persuade each other to be together. Love is risk. In other words, I'm going to risk telling you about that thing I did when I was 20, right? And you don't leave. Okay, well, then you're going to risk telling me that thing about you. You're going to tell me about those dreams you had that never came true. You're going to tell me about these petty hates you have of this crew over here. And suddenly we find ourselves really, really, really liking each other. Now, of course, there's positive stuff too. So don't anybody think like, you know, love is hate. What I'm saying though, is that we, we, we fall into these relationships of trust and we don't tell anybody to love us because love doesn't work that way. Love is earned. Love is earned through a, a mutual vulnerability that eventually, uh, becomes fairly exclusive. So I like to say uh, love is uh, maximum exclusivity, or excuse me, maximum vulnerability in exchange for maximum exclusivity. And you ask, what's the difference between a good friend and an acquaintance? And it's the ability to share vulnerability. So I got to say all that stuff. Now, no one was going to ask me a Kilgrave question. Like, you know, it wasn't going to happen. Yet because someone, I did something that someone didn't expect I would do in a Shiro's panel, I suddenly got to say all this great stuff about love while playing the verbal man. I mean, it, that's just the, that's just the serendipity, um, the exciting stuff uh, that happens in these contexts. And so it's not like I was all excited. I got to say that in a moment, I'll admit there's a little, a little bit of, damn, man, I'm, whew, I guess, you know, but, um, Good for her, you know, and then let's just uh, let's continue to have adult conversations. So, yeah, that was a time when I did something that some maybe thought I wouldn't do or may have looked like I like something that I didn't really like. I don't know if that answered your question. You gave me a lot of time. I appreciate it, Eric. Um, but I actually love that story. Well, and, and to, to sort of bring at least the the way that I see the threads connecting through our entire conversation is you kind of some ways brought like two things together, right? Two big themes that have come out for me is yeah. risk yeah. and performance. Yeah. There's risk and performance in cosplay. Well, there's risk and performance in life period, exactly. um, but there is also risk and performance in being a panelist in teaching. Yeah. Right. And yeah. You got to in a sort of a meta level when <laughs> merge those all together. Celebrating that risk. Yeah. Ce celebrating. I, I like to say celebrating the work. Yes. Um, and it almost starts to feel pagan, right? As opposed to, you know, a monotheism. It's just celebrating the work of being uh, and the risks, the love, the hate, the joy, all of it. That's part of it. Um, because in that moment, right. When that young woman said, dude, what are you doing? Is this a joke? I mean, she didn't say it that way. I'm amplifying her now. But I could have gone defensive, uh -huh. right? But given who I am, given I knew, I knew, I knew that dressing up at Kilgrave could be problematic. Now, problematic doesn't mean I shouldn't do it. Problematic right. means that someone may not like it. And then what I did was take the risk of maybe having a conversation with them about love or something like that, that they'd never heard because they were calling me out on doing that. Um, so celebrating all of that. Absolutely. Um, and, I, and I know you, uh, you, and you maybe have even used the phrase earlier in this conversation. I know you used it in a lot of other contexts that everything is about everything, right? Everything's about that everything. That social context was so complex and, and social because there was you as moderator. Yeah. You how it also involved panelists who you all talked about this you all were, worked together there was the audience member and yeah any one of you all could have depending upon your choices your the what what you say what you respond it could have gone in a very direction right but that was oh. a very interesting jazz that you had in that oh, moment. i picked well i picked a good i invited good teammates um to be you know on the panel and um when i the panel description said at the end 
Uh, please know that this panel will be moderated by Kilgrave the Purple Man. We cannot vouch for his safety, right? So all of that was in the space, at least in the description. And um, I just want quickly want to uh, just something that may have been overlooked. This is a young lady doing the Scarlet Witch, right? So she dressed up as a Marvel Shiro. And what we did was we played the match game. So I don't know if you remember the match game, but uh, I would ask them a question like uh, uh, Captain Marvel said to Jessica Jones, how did you become such a cynical person? Jessica Jones responded, blank. And then the person that came up had to give an answer. And then every member of the panel had to give an answer. And uh, someone wrote like, uh, I learned it from your mama. I mean, all kinds of funny stuff. So you get this incredibly rich adult play environment while you have these questions that pop up. The jazz keeps going. It may take on a minor key for a moment, right? As as things get a little deep. Um, um, and for me, that's just good after dinner nuance. And if you got the right dinner guests, I mean, look, you're absolutely right. That conversation could have gone totally different. There's a lot of people right now who don't want conversation, who don't think you should do anything that might be mildly offensive or offensive to someone. And I can understand how that feels. And I can understand the compulsion to say it. At the same time, that's not the life I live. I don't, I listen. Why, why, what's being said with all lives matter? What's being said with make America great again? Just, just listen to it. And um, don't tell people, I mean, I, I'm not going to, I don't tell people don't say it. You know, I, I, uh, I, I, it's out there. And then I try to take it in and, and, modulated in whatever way I might want to, to persuade people that might not be the most self-respecting way to carry yourself or to perform yourself. Right. Um, so yeah, I was, I, I was on the stage with the right crew and, uh, and you know, when Shelly said, we're going to beat him up afterwards, that brought me a couple of seconds, right. Bought me about five, seven or eight seconds to figure out what I was going to say. Didn't get defensive and, you know, just said, yeah, it was intentional. And I didn't apologize um because it was an adult conversation and um you don't get you don't get to the nuance by saying no and you don't get to the nuance by shutting up so uh we lived it we lived it out verbally we lived it out in, in the cosplay and, and very very memorable Excellent, excellent. Well, I think that's a a good place to uh, to wrap. Um, mm. well, uh, please tell the audience where they can uh, uh, find more about you and your various interests online. Oh well, thank you for that, Eric. Um, if you type the phrase "wild systems theory," that would be three different words. If you type "wild systems theory" into the Google machine, you'll see a bunch of my papers come up. Um, I've actually spent the last twenty years starting almost every single paper I've written with the word wild. Um, is it branding? Oh, hell yes. It's exactly what it is. And um, <laughs> and I want to own the word wild in contemporary scholarship. And so that's why that's there. Uh, and um, I also, as you can sort of see behind me here, I produce a channel on YouTube, Dark Loops Productions, um, where I'm also known as Sir Zombie Scotty which is a name, as I said earlier, bestowed on me by the wonderful women of Sister Speak Productions. Um, and if you type dark, bleh, dark Loops Productions uh, into the Google machine, um, it'll take you to the YouTube page. It'll also take you to locations where all the podcast versions of the uh, vodcasts on YouTube um, can be found. So for about three or four months, I've been putting these things up in audio only as podcasts. And we do a lot of what, you know, you're doing here. Um, Dark Loops Productions is the Uber name. And then I'll have series like, you know, like you were on a series with me, the What If Crew, right? Um, and then we'll do like the Lasso Crew. Um, being an anti-racist these are all sorts of different series that i do under the name of dark loops productions so wild systems theory and dark loops productions and i think you'll find just about everything worth knowing <laughs> 
Well, thank you for uh, for sharing time with us today and uh, telling us your uh, and um, uh, yeah, look forward to uh, to more conversations about this and other things in the future. Well, thank you for the the opportunity to answer your questions, Eric. I very much appreciate it. And to anybody watching, thank you so much for watching.